All right. Thank you so much to folks tuning in today for our panel focused on monitoring, reporting, and verification for carbon removal. Really excited with the panelists we have to talk about why MRV is critical to scaling the carbon removal market. I think it's great to be spotlighting suppliers, representing a range of different pathways, and really hearing from companies about how you're all thinking about MRV in, in the carbon removal space. So I'm Ben Rubin. I'm the executive director of the Carbon Business Council. We're a nonprofit trade association of more than 100 companies working on carbon removal. Uh, we're fortunate to have these three companies in, in the Carbon Business Council. And so let's just begin from hearing from each of you. Uh, Brief introduction, tell me who, who you are, what you're doing, and, and initial reactions here that you've been having at COP since you've been on the ground. Brad, we can start with you. Yeah, happy to start. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for having us. So I'm Brad Rockland. Uh, I run partnerships at Running Tide. Running Tide is an ocean, uh, an ocean carbon removal company. We have a multi-pathway approach uh, using natural materials. We take terrestrial forest residue, coat it in alkaline material, and seed it with macroalgae. So these are intended to be free-floating, distributed to the open ocean, letting ocean currents do much of that work, uh, the work of carbon removal for us. Um, and over a course of several weeks, the alkalinity dissolves on the surface ocean, the, uh, and the terrestrial biomass, the embodied carbon within the terrestrial biomass, and the accumulated uh, carbon within the macroalgae biomass, buoyancy flips, and it sinks down to the deep ocean for durable storage. Uh, so I've been in and around the, uh, the carbon markets for the last five or six years. It's now my fourth straight COP uh, working and thinking about carbon markets. Um, and, you know, I remember, you know, four years ago, right, when you came to the carbon markets event, uh, carbon markets events, it tended to be Shell and other, and other oil majors talking about trading forest carbon at 3 to $5 per ton and fungibility of those assets. Fast forward a year, you saw the Amazons and the, sh and the, and the uh, sales forces of the world coming into the space. Fast forward to last year uh, in, in Charm, and you were seeing all of these new carbon removal solutions. And now today, it's sort of exploded with uh, pathways, uh, you know, you know do, new approaches to removing carbon uh, sort of popping up every day. Uh, and this is, you know, it's exciting to see it all coalesce and the momentum in the space right now. Great. Mike? Uh, yeah, so I'm Mike Helland. I'm CEO of Planetary Technologies. Uh, we do ocean alkalinity enhance enhancement coastally. So essentially what we do is we take uh, byproducts from industrial processes. We uh, ensure that they're safe for the ocean and then uh, add them through existing wastewater and power plant infrastructure uh, under existing permits into the sea and measure the uh, carbon removed. So measurement, I think, is going to be a big part of the discussion today. Um, this is, it's interesting, you know, what you say, Brad, in terms of the growth in the general sort of climate community around an understanding of permanent CDRs and the need for that and the growth in that space. Uh, this is my first COP, so I'm a COP virgin in this way. But not it, anymore. It, not anymore. No. Yeah. Exactly. So it's been it's been awesome, uh, and um, but honestly, it's also the first COP that I think I felt that I should go to. You know, I think that I think that as Brad said, you know, that this this is growing in the general understanding within the space, and you know, going to major climate conferences in the past, not COP, but but others. You know, when I talk about what we're doing, people would be like, "Well, why don't we just plant some trees? Like, why do you really need to do that?" And um, and this now we're having like much more, I think, informed conversations about the need for permanent removals on top of land use change and forestry and all of these kinds of things. So really, I can think a moment and, um, and it's just been awesome to be here and be part of that. And, you know, the days are packed, right? It's, it's wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining online. Um, I'm Han Noyanen. I'm head of carbon markets and policy at Carboculture. We're a biochar carbon removal company. Uh, we've been around since 2018. Um, just this year, uh, built one of Europe's largest carbon removal facilities in, in Helsinki, Finland, uh, removing 3,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, raised our Series A last week, and now we're here at our first COP. So it's been very, very, very exciting um, uh, to work, work in the space in the past year. Um, my work uh, focuses a lot on, on policy, of course, and, and general, general carbon market development, where both uh, you know, MRV and methodologies are, are very present. Um, the EU you know, and the Brussels, where I'm based, is a good example of this, because you know, before they can even have a carbon mobile strategy, which the IPCC has been asking for, um, because the EU has a net zero strategy, they need to figure out what the heck carbon removal is. And, uh, and so that's what we've been you know, trying to figure out. And of course, if you want to define what something is, you need to be able to you know, measure, verify, and report it. Um, but of course, you know, we've, we've been exchanging and uh, doing carbon removal in the voluntary carbon markets um, 
for um, for some time now. So so been very much engaged in the in the methodologies and certification bodies there. We're we're verified by Puro Earth, uh, which just got their ICRO verification. Um, I think early this year or yeah early this year or late last year. And um, and so yeah, it's a very exciting space, especially since you know the you know the wide variety of methods, um, you know, and how how do we you know even differentiate them or or should we you know nature based, technology based, uh, traditional, novel CDR, um, and you know just understanding and, and really creating the capacity to understand that you know all of them will require uh, individual MRVs and you know principles can we can align with but but because all these methods are are so unique you know we we really need to pay pay that um or keep that in mind great yeah thanks so much for that and appreciate all of your introductions i think exciting as we start to take a deeper dive into MRV in particular monitoring reporting and verification just that we have a range of pathways here represented and i think when we're talking about carbon removal Carbon removal encompasses a, a range of pathways. The Carbon Business Council itself is a tech neutral organization representing all types of carbon removal, but MRV really cuts across all of them. Uh, there was a Bloomberg article that came out not too long ago with the headline was something like MRV are the three most important letters in CDR. Um, and so I guess just to start before we start unpacking the trends of carbon removal, how in within MRV, the the ways that your companies are thinking about it, just Building on that Bloomberg headline, would be great to hear from your perspective of CDR companies working on scaling up the, the industry. Why do, do you agree with that headline? And and if so, why why do you think MRV is is so critical? Um, Hannah, you were starting to touch on this, so let's start with you on this one, and we'll we'll work our way down. All right, thanks, Ben. Yeah, definitely. MRV, the three most important letters. I mean, you know, for us, we're developing our proprietary technology, um, innovating every day at our facility. So for us, it's it's definitely important to have an MRV, and and we're we're really pushing the carbon removal capacity and optimizing carbon removal for biochar. Um, and of course, for us, it's important that you know when we are you know looking and 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 fitting into these MRV um, systems and methodologies that they also accept and and acknowledge and cherish the innovat innovations that we're we're doing as a company. I mean, of course, you know, in a, what kind of a world would we live in if, you know, 100 years ago we would have said, okay, this is a car and this is the engine of a car and this is the type of car we're going to drive for the next 200 years. Um, and so, so that's definitely been something that, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, doing. How do we, uh, how do we measure? How do we, um, how do we, um, yeah, make make this you know very vague thing called carbon removal into into numbers and lab results and and uh, LCAs, um, and so so for us it's um it's it's quite great with biochar because you know it's a it's a solid stable form of ca carbon that comes out of the pyrolysis reactor so we can send it to a lab we can test the carbon content we can test the um, the PAH levels we can really you know get the laboratorians you know well uh, well versed with our biochar can have an LCA team, auditors, third-party verifiers come to our facility, see that carbon removal is taking place, how much of carbon removal is taking place, where do we source our biomass, um, and of course with the lab results we can also get a very close look on biochar durability. Uh, that's something we've been we've been focusing uh, a lot on, testing our biochar with all the new methods and really um, hitting them off the park. So, so, um, so that's definitely um, you know it's important for us because without MRV there would also be no one to say hey look at this great innovation that you've done in the field. Um, but of course, it's also important that um, we keep developing these and updating these methodologies and, and, and of course the MRV within them. Great, thanks. Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think MRV is probably the most important thing because fundamentally that is the definition of our, our impact and for a, a company like the three of us, it's also the definition of our product, right? And so the product doesn't exist unless you can measure it appropriately with, uh, you know, well-defined amounts of uncertainty and, and um, you know, you can be very confident and clear that the product has been delivered. You know, essentially the carbon has been delivered, the removal has been delivered. And that's, that's important, I think, from the perspective of both building this industry, you know, we know, um, I think on, on this side of the stage, we know the challenge we have ahead of us. And I think that people are starting to understand that a little bit more. But when you read through, uh, and, and it, you know, talk about climate, I think these days we've come blase to the word gigaton. Gigaton's a lot, like it's huge. A billion tons of something, like it's, it's a phenomenal amount. You know, the world, I think, extracts about 2.1 billion tons of crude oil every year right now. 
And so if you think about that scale of the crude oil extraction around the world and all of the energy needs that that fulfills, that's only 2.1. And we could be at a point where we need, you know, between, you know, most optimistic a couple of gigatons a year all the way up to like 20 possibly per year. And so I think this, the scale of um, that requirement and the scale of the problem we had to have ahead of us means that we need to ensure that we know very clearly the impact that we're having, that we can um, you know, market that impact against the problem that we're facing, both from the perspective of getting to net zero, but also from the perspective of fulfilling those climate goals uh, on the negative emission side of things. Great, thanks, Brad. Yeah, plus one on all those. Uh, and uh, you know, just take a slightly different flavor on this, and Paul, just Mike's heard me say this before, but. Uh, I think MRV for people who are new to the space can be a super inaccessible term, right? I try to avoid saying it because when somebody comes to you and says with nature-based systems or open systems, MRV is important, you're kind of just saying everything that these companies do is important, right? So the ability to disaggregate those things and say, when it comes to measurement, what is important? Are you using modeling? Are you using direct measurement? Are you using laboratory testing? How do you combine those? What standards are you going to be reporting against? And how does that, how do some of those generally accepted uh, means by which you can measure carbon or environmental attributes or biodiversity or you know all the all the components that go into understanding the full environmental and climatic scope of your project. Uh, how do you do that? And then when you go to the reporting components, right? How can we make sure that people have access to the available information so that they can understand if your project has been effective or not? Do you have to report against certain policy frameworks? How do we think about long-term communicating the work has been done? And then verification is trust building, right? How can you ensure that the work, because these are intangible assets that we are creating, we are, we are tracking the movement of a, of a gas that you cannot see um, into long-term storage. And you know, especially for some of the solutions like, like Mike and I up here, uh, the verification space in the ocean is incredibly new, right? Is, you, there is no one you can go to and say, can you come check my work, right? You actually have to get folks up the learning curve. So, Disaggregating those buckets and where do researchers fit in? Where does government and policy fit in? Where does the work that you do as a company, whether that's innovation or working with partners who can help you do the measurement, uh, becomes really critical. So I think our ability to, to speak about that in ways that, especially industry, can, uh, large scale industry who is trying to support the, you know, the um, ability of these, these solutions to scale uh, is gonna be really important to make sure that we're actually building the right things and people don't just nod along and say MRV is important, but then come out of that without clear and tangible steps that they can take to improve and reduce uncertainty uh, within you know within all of these different various solutions. Yeah, great, great thoughts from all of you on that. I think, uh, appreciate kind of the complementary nature of what you were all adding on to it. And I think it's a great point how MRV can appear all alongside one another, but appreciate that disaggregation to really understand how many sub points are embedded in when we're talking about any one of those letters around the, the monitoring, reporting, and verification of removals. Uh, Brad, you touched on the protocols that, that folks can follow. And so want to drill a little deeper into that and specifically have you talk a little bit more about the Reykjavik protocol that was released not too long ago during uh, during climate week in September and just unpacking what went into that and, and what it is. What do you want folks to know about it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, some context here, right, is we've had obviously voluntary carbon markets uh, that have been around for, for decades at this point. And, and in many ways, they're going through this evolution, BCM 1.0 to 2.0, uh, looking at the way that some of those standards, the foundational, uh, you know, the foundational rule sets upon which many of these markets are built need to be improved and iterated as they are moving from something that has been fairly niche to something that, you know, people expect to be integrated in a large scale global financial systems. Adjacent to that, uh, or maybe complementary to that, and that's frankly part of the challenge, you have all of this massive innovation happening within the carbon removal world, sort of CDR or durable CDR versus the VCM 1.0, 2.0, right? And in many cases, when these folks are innovating, they don't have a great sense of what the path to market should be. When I'm doing my first research project all the way to, I want somebody to pay me for an, an environmental activity I have taken, who do I need to work with along that chain? Right now, you know, there are the various registries who, who do amazing work in the space. But, you know, when you're talking about brand new to world projects, it can be difficult for them to understand how they will fit into that ecosystem on a long-term basis. So I think the Reykjavik protocol really came out of that, which is as we expect these markets to be able to scale, sort of regardless of who, uh, who is sort of active in the space right now, can we create an industry architecture that goes from the first project that you do, or the, the first research that you do to the, to the first credits that you issue, 
who is the risk counterparty across each of those steps? What is the activity that you take within that? And how can we ensure that we have a deconflicted process, right? So one of the things Running Tide has done, right, is we've tried very hard to get the uh, big four auditors engaged in this space, right? They have a lot of the capacity and, uh, and the confidence and the trust to be able to come in and look at, have you followed the right data collection standards? Have you followed the right processes? That's not going to tell you everything you need to know by a long shot about if a project is effective or not. But what they can do is provide a very specific avenue of risk mitigation that builds confidence in both the underlying system and the project itself. So maybe I can add on to that and, and just speak to Running Tide's leadership actually on this, which has been phenomenal. I attended this Reykjavik protocol meeting um, and uh, honestly, even having you know, built this company over the last four years, I still had and still have a huge amount of like still learning to do on all of the vagaries of the existing carbon markets, the registries, how they work, like what all the challenges are, all those things. I think we've been an innovator on the core of our MRV, right? So like you know, the actual sort of metering and measurement of our process of ocean alkalinity enhancement. But what the Reykjavik protocol activity did, and if you're interested in carbon markets and you're interested in getting into it, is that there's like a, a diagram that Marty uh, at Running Tide put together that just spells out exactly what all the roles are. And you just can sort of look at that and instantly kind of get it. And you're like, oh, okay, well, this is exactly what we need to do. And you can take a registry player or a marketplace player or a supplier or a validator or verifier and say, okay, if I take this sort of flow and sort of you know, fit that in, I can very, very quickly conceptualize that. So, as Brad says, if you're new to the markets, if you're getting into this space, if you're trying to understand all of the players and how they work, the Reykjavik protocol is actually a bit of a map, and it helps to show that. Beyond that, you know, it, it then says, look, you could map it all out using this map, but then here are some principles that will improve the process. And I think you know, just uh, applying those principles are really the way that we're going to scale the carbon markets. I, I often look at this from the perspective of, Today, you know, voluntary markets, depending on who you ask, somewhere between a billion and two billion dollars a year kind of thing. And all of the removals basically sit in the voluntary markets. You know, the, the compliance markets that are out there are primarily emissions trading markets. They're not, they're offset markets. They're not really removals markets for the most part. Um, so when you, when you look at that and you say, okay, well, it's, you know, average price for a credit right now, $3.50, I think, on average, and sort of like a billion to two billion dollars. What we need to be at it, by 2030, in a very short period of time, is sort of 50 to $250 billion market on the removal side with you know, prices that might range between $100 and $300 a ton. And that is an incredibly different market than we're in today. So the Reykjavik protocol in showing this sort of pathway also helps us to really visualize what that market has to be to scale in the way that we need it to scale in order to grow the removals industry in a climate relevant way. And I, I just add to that, it's far from perfect, right? This was a group of uh, you know, suppliers and, uh, and academics who came together from different parts of the nature based ecosystem, traditional forestry, soil carbon measurement, ocean space, enhanced weathering, and said, look, within 95%, we all agree on the same things about how this needs to be built, right? So. You know, with a fairly, fairly, you know, obviously a lot of work from the folks in the room, but without really much of a push or governance behind it, we've managed to get, I think, close to 60 companies signed up to say they want to adhere to this, proto this protocol and the, and the principles within it, right? So I'm very excited to see, as it's getting pick up, picked up and adopted, uh, the way that this can start to help build confidence for solutions across the nature-based space and also in their, you know, at different levels of maturity as we can start to report against it and get auditors engaged with it and get registries engaged with it, both the folks within that VCM 2.0 process and the New World projects and say, are these the same market? Are they different now? Will they converge? And what is the rule set that we're all agreeing to follow underneath that? Excellent. And congrats on having being up to more than 60 signatories. I, I think it's great to see the momentum of it. Um, Hannah, I want to go over to you because we've been talking and, and hearing a little bit about uh, on the protocol side of the equation, the connection to voluntary carbon markets. Mike was touching on compliance markets, but just as we're starting to go into compliance markets and also thinking about the policy side of the equation, just in general when we're talking about carbon removal, there's um, what are innovators doing in the space, what, what's happening in the market, but also what do what the policies look like? And so I think to hear from you the, the policy trends you're seeing around MRV and particularly if there's anything you want to touch on with what's moving right now in the EU with the carbon removal certification framework would just be 
Great to hear your insights around this intersection between MRV and policy. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, thanks, Tim, already for, for touching on the compliance markets. Of course, the VCM has been great to get removals to a good good start. But, you know, it's been, you know, one to two billions, you know, one to two billion euros on uh, market size. You know, if we look at the EU ETS, it's it's closer to 800 billion. So it's it's definitely, you know, the kind of market size that will help um, help the CDR scale and help durable CDR scale. Um, at, uh, at the moment, we can really see a trajectory from the CRCF, so the Carbon Mobile Certification Framework, into how the EU can start building a strategy for removals and a strategy for somehow integrating removals into, into the compliance market. Whether, whether it's going to be the ETS, that's still uncertain, but the Commission is going to come out uh, with a report in the next two years on, on how they could possibly integrate removals into the ETS. There's still discussions on should we have, you know, a central uh, European carbon bank or, or you know, some other, um, other body. But at the moment it seems that, you know, perhaps the permanent storage um, uh, category of the of the CRCF would, would move into under the ETS because of course you know you shouldn't have anything to trade you know by 2035 um, and of course you know we're excited to see already the impacts of uh, of of the the industries that that are under the ETS you know steel um, uh, construction industry, um, how they are already looking at these decarbonization options, you know, a lot more keenly, um, knowing that they're they're not going to have any more uh, free emissions rights to trade by 2030. So that's been that's been a great push. Of course, now uh, in the CRCF, we're very much in the beginning. We saw some blog posts and some LinkedIn posts about how everything was sorted and done and dusted and voted on, but that wasn't true. Um, in fact, we're just in the trilogues. Of course, there's a lot of ambition and a lot of uh, pressure to get this done under the current mandate, which is going to end next year. So, so there's going to be a last parliament plenary in February, um, the third week of February, when they really want to really really want to get this done and dusted. So, so that's kind of the timeline that we're now looking at. If if there's you know any folks here who still want to influence influence the EU, EU CRCF. Um, uh, the trilogues are going on, so the trilogues basically mean, yeah, the EU Parliament, Council and Commission are negotiating on their own opinions, the Council has done their general approach, the, um, the Parliament usually follows their, their committees, which was the Envy Committee, Environment Committee in this time, um, their opinion on this. And, uh, and yeah, it's been really fantastic to see because at first there was this risk that uh, some parliamentarians just wanted to kill the entire file. Like, no, like this is this is greenwashing. You know, we shouldn't even discuss about removals. But then, of course, thank thankfully we have the mandate from the IPCC. We know we need removals. Um, so so in that sense, it's um, we're already um, already in a good um, in a good run. There's still some little things that we need to iron out, such as you know tying all permanent or durable storage solutions to the CCS directive, which is a bit of a misconception. Um, you know, I come from the biochar sphere. Um, there was an understanding, there was even a mention of biochar in the permanent storage category. Like, yeah, biochar is in the permanent storage category, but oh, we're still gonna tie the MRV to the CCS directive. And then the the, the shadow rapporteur is coming later, like, oh, sorry, yeah, whoopsie, that was a mistake. We're gonna, we're gonna iron that out in the trilogues. But, um, but definitely, I think, you know, we're only just coming up with this terminology, right? Like, if you know, we still see CDR and CCS or CDR and CCUS being mixed all the time. So I think especially when we're talking about, you know, the CDR methods that don't fall under CCS infrastructure, it's super important to really have that differentiation that yes, we do need CCS-based CDR, such as BEX and DUX, but we also need biochar, we also need ocean-based solutions. And, and understanding the variety of MRV that's needed and how that's not uh, a hindrance, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, it's actually the thing that's going to make, um, make CDR scale at the speed um, and to the size that the IPCC has asked for. So, so um, at the moment, the two other categories are carbon farming and carbon stored in products, um, of which there's going to be a delegated act from the commission, which basically means, yeah, the delegated act is going to come from the commission, go to the parliament. Uh, the parliament can just say yes or no. So if you want to influence that, then reach out to our friends at the commission. Um, and hopefully we're going to see another delegated act that will come um, for the permanent storage options that are not uh, geological storage as well. Great, yeah, thank you so much for walking through that. Um, I'll, I'll let you add in, because it sounded like you had one more thing to say, and, and just to, just in case folks are tuning in and want to hear more about CRCF or aren't familiar with that acronym, um, any any additional thoughts you want, or just to tell us what the acronym is, and maybe in a sentence or two, you know, why 
Um, I specifically asked you about MRV within the CRCF, but if we zoom out just for folks to know why the CRCF is important in, in Europe policy too, it would be great. Yeah, definitely. So um, in order to have a strategy on carbon removal to match the net zero strategy that the EU has, they've established this carbon removal certification framework proposal to actually define what are high quality carbon removal. So taking some of the principles that we see in the VCM, additionality, sustainability, um, uh, long-term storage, um, as to name a few. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm glad that we, you know, we've been able to cover so far what MRV is and why it's important and the protocols and the intersection of policy. That is a lot of this rests at a level that I think will help, as, as you've all been saying, scale the industry in, in the aggregate. And so it's been great to hear your opening responses there. But each of you are also working on MRV within your companies um, at, at a very specific project level. And that's really where I think a lot of this hits home. Yes, it's in the frameworks. Yes, it's in the policy. Yes, it's in the protocols. But uh, it'd be great to just drill a little bit deeper into what MRV is looking like in, in each of your companies, how you're thinking about it, the opportunities, any challenges you're, you're, you're running into. So just to have you each expand on that, I think MRV, Mike, it'd be great to start with you on this because MRV questions come up around ocean alkalinity enhancement. And, and so let's start with you and then we'll go to Brad and Hannah on this one. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so MRV as you say, like for ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, you know, across across the board, I think there's a general misconception about MRV, which is that it's impossible. Um, and actually, it's quite easy uh, and very low uncertainty in terms of uh, how to do MRV for just straight up ocean alkalinity enhancement. So we were leaders in this uh, starting about a year and a half ago. We, we put out the first version of our MRV framework. And the MRV framework is actually very simple. Uh, the way that it works is that you take some alkalinity and you take some seawater and you can very directly and accurately measure how much carbon that alkalinity in the seawater is going to take up. And so that's kind of like, you know, directly your measurement of the process. And you can get that, you know, like I say, very, very accurate in terms of that. I add, you know, one ton of alkalinity, I'm going to get, you know, 1.25 tons of carbon pulled out of the atmosphere. Uh, and that's that's pretty straightforward. The uh, the step that I think a lot of people uh, have confusion about, or or are concerned about, or you know, there's a lot of sort of trepidation about, is when we actually do that in the environment, right? It's what is the efficiency of that in the real world? Like how close to that hundred percent that we measured in the lab are we actually going to get in in the real world? And uh, that is something that we will not be able to. Uh, directly measure. If you think about it, the ocean is massive. You know, this stuff distributes across the ocean. Uh, and even if you can measure your effect here, you know, measuring it sort of globally is, is a huge challenge. And I never say never, but maybe one day. But, um, but these are incredibly well understood processes. In fact, the understanding of the carbon sink in the ocean is much, much, much better than our understanding of the carbon sink on land. So we can actually get to very low levels of uncertainty about that efficiency within the ocean with the tools that we have today and the understanding of ocean chemistry. It's really not uh, a confusing thing at all. Um, one of the key things in that efficiency, the biggest part of the efficiency, is um, when we release alkalinity into the sea, we have a period of time that it takes for the carbon to come out of the air and react to the alkalinity and be stored permanently within the ocean's chemistry. So that's sort of like the drawdown piece of it. And um, in large parts of the ocean, we have a very strong, very low uncertainty understanding that that is going to happen, that that, that piece of water that we've alkalinized is going to stay in contact with the atmosphere for long enough for that to be drawn down. And if we pick our sites carefully, we can get to basically 100% efficiency with very, very low uncertainty within that model. Um, uh, if we don't pick our sites carefully, then it might sink and end up you know, in deep in the ocean before that happens, and we don't actually get the removal from the atmosphere that we're looking for. So we have to be careful about it. But if we choose carefully our sites, we actually drop our uncertainty to, to very, very low levels. And I would say much, much lower uncertainties than uh, you know, pathways that would be considered to be sort of measurable directly. right? Uh, and so that's that's a really interesting part of it. From there, I mean, uh, you know, Brad mentioned this. We we uh, on the MRV side of things, I think a lot of people, when they hear about our process and how it works, they're like, "Wait a second, though, are you really counting all of your emissions?" And the answer is like, absolutely. You know, we actually 
I, I think in our last project, we accounted for the amount of cardboard we used on site, right? Like, it is really a cradle to grave kind of view of the uh, point of alkalinity production, the transportation, the, you know, uh, project emissions. We include flights for people who have to fly in to help to operate the project. Like, it is a really sort of a comprehensive view of the LCA of the process that gets subtracted from that. Uh, and then even then, on top of that, because we're early days within this industry, and there is that trepidation, we're incorporating uncertainty in the form of a holdback. And so this is a voluntary holdback of credits that says, you know, essentially looking at the, at the path of the science and the levels of certainty we have today, that no matter what, our process is undercrediting. And that undercrediting then can be credited in the future for past activities once we, you know, continue to reduce the uncertainty in the process. So um, it's, uh, it's been an interesting thing that, um, that there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, about this in the space. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern. I think a lot of people, you know, just generally, we're terrestrial species. We don't understand the ocean all that well compared to everything else on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, sort of like the general people who are walking the land here are sort of much more comfortable with the tree than what's going on in the ocean because we just don't live there. Um, and I think that leads to some of that trepidation. But realistically, uh, it is a, uh, it's a, it's an interesting process, but actually a very simple process to do the MRV for ocean alkalinity enhancement. Great. I appreciate you walking through that and, and helping to uh, talk about both what, what it's like to measure the different associated emissions with the project, the, the uncertainty, so, and, and how to reduce that uncertainty is, is great and, and I think really helpful. While we're on the ocean before we go to land, it would, would be great to hear from Brad because I think it highlights too that there's not one, because there's different CDR approaches, there's not a, a one MRV pathway. There, there's multiple pathways, and so there's multiple ways to measure. So it would, would be great to hear how Running Tide is thinking about this. Yeah, I mean, other than the, other than the name Ocean, uh, Mike, Mike and I's processes don't look all that similar, right? So sometimes we say, you know, we have to figure out Ocean MRV, and that's the equivalent of saying that we have to figure out Terrestrial MRV, right? It's just this, it's, it's representative of an entire category of potential solutions, many of which we've barely even tested before. Uh, and within that, we make it a little harder on ourselves, right? We do we do operate multi-pathways, but that's very intentional in thinking about what we think is scalable in the long term and can maximize our carbon benefit. And also in terms of the measurements you have to collect across those, right? So this past year, like I mentioned, we had terrestrial biomass that we coded in alkalinity. Uh, and when you're looking at terrestrial biomass quantification, you can get direct measurements of the, essentially through, via testing, laboratory testing, of the carbon content of that biomass. You can have camera systems to make sure that you can see how much biomass is actually, you know, staying on the boat or staying in one place. You can do measurements on site. So the majority of the measurements associated with doing terrestrial biomass sinking, you can actually collect prior to it going out to the ocean. And then factoring uncertainty factors, of course, for loss uh, and materials that might dissolve at the surface ocean along the way. But that is largely a physical oceanographic process. We want to know where this material was deployed, how the plume sort of, uh, you know, uh, the shape of the plume as it, as it distributed through the ocean, and then eventually what point that sank, right? And also, layering on the alkalinity components, how fast does that material dissolve and what are the implications there, right? So we have a full oceanographic team who is telling us both the locations we should deploy based on the eventual end state of that carbon uh, and a range of chemist and laboratory, laboratory testing to, to look at the other components. The macroalgae components are at a slightly smaller scale. We're sort of doing these open ocean pilots at the moment, haven't fully layered those on. But our you know, hypothesis is that when you're doing things like GPS trajectory buoys or these larger what we call camera buoys that right now you can see how long that material floats when you deploy, you could actually start to collect data and information across those range of pathways that informs the total carbon cycling because these are open complex systems. And that data feeds back into the models and the laboratory testing that informs your prior which makes the models better. And then the cycle starts to circle on itself, right? So I think. Uh, one of the things that's really important with the ocean space or with these sort of, uh, you know, systems that can utilize nature is that we have to get comfortable with some level of model-based carbon accounting, right? Uh, you are never going to measure every molecule of carbon as it moves through the ocean or how you track it. You shouldn't. That would be an inefficient use of resources. But the same way that we model climatic shifts uh, in terms of the carbon we are emitting... Uh, and the atmospheric parts per million, we can begin to model as we are removing carbon and tracking the parts per million coming down. So our ability to uh, find local and regional models and use data to inform them and make those better and use laboratory testing and in situ measurement to continue to refine those systems is going to really help these solutions that have the capacity to scale found their uncertainty and start to bring their products to market in a way that provides confidence in the underlying system. Because if we are trying to 
overemphasize certainty and just say only projects where you can measure every atom of carbon that flows all the way through, this industry will not scale nearly at the speed at which it needs to. Great. And I want you to jump in to share your thoughts around this and also to highlight how Carbo Culture has been thinking about MRV. Yeah, like just, you know, plus one to everything that was said before, especially what Brad said, you know, there would be no projects because there's an element of trust in, in every kind of MRV. And I mean, of course, I think it's fantastic that while we are building this market, um, you know, we are building it right, you know. It's not like, you know, many of the large multinationals and corporations who are just now trying to fi figure out their scope one, two, three emissions. Um, you know, we as uh, the startups that, you know, make the entire CDR space are, are doing it from the get-go. So I think it's, it's amazing that we can, we can get this right and there's a great ambition to do so. I mean, obviously, we're, we're certified by Puro Earth. We've already been for years. Um, we, um, we've been following their biochar methodology that yeah, looks at um, yeah, sustainable uh, biomass, uh, how do we source it, our LCA, our net carbon removal, the durability of biochar. Um, they look at the hydrogen to carbon measurement. I mean, for us, you know, when we, when we do laboratory testing, we can look at the label fraction and the inert fraction of the biochar. So in the biochar, there's like a, depends on a 1% to max 20% fraction of the biochar um, that will decompose in the soils, but the majority of it, for us, it's 99% that, that's inert. It's more like anthracite. Like if you look at carbon as a spectrum, you know, you have one of these plants that we have, one of those leaves of the plants that we have in the room. I don't know if they're fake or not, but let's pretend that they're real. And so you have that leaf, and then you have the diamond that's on, you know, the ring in my finger, you know? Uh, those are all carbon. They're just different, um, you know, they have a different stability. They have a different, you know, molecular, molecular structure. And, you know, so for us, it's, it's quite um, easy to do that kind of measurement. Like, okay, we're not even going to count that 1% or 20% in the biochar into the carbon removal or the net removal accounting. Um, for us, of course, um, it's, um, it's really interesting because to do biochar LCA because we already stabilize the carbon in the reactor. So, um, so for us, you know, we keep the supply chains relatively uh, short. And I mean, I understand that if you want certainty in your supply chains, keep them short. That applies for any other industry, uh, you know, biochar and, and CDR included. So for us, you know, yeah, we, we, we transport the sustainable biomass in California. We are right next to a walnut farm, so we're taking the waste walnut shells. Uh, in Finland, it's waste sawdust pellets from a local sawmill who would otherwise, yeah, just burn them in a boiler. Um, so, so in that sense, it's, uh, it's very um, easy to do, to do this, um, this supply chain management. Um, and then when you stabilize the carbon, it's relatively easy to transport the, the biomass. It's just like, you know, all three of us, we're, we're not dealing... Um, with um, with gases carbon or liquid carbon, it's it's solid carbon, so so that makes it relatively easy, and that's why I sometimes wonder, yeah, because there's these ideas of like, oh, you know, is it so hard? And <laughs> yeah, um, it's 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 uh, of course, you know, it's um, for every industry, it's uh, it's not, you know, you wouldn't want to leave it to someone in kindergarten to calculate, but but, but you know, apart from that, it's uh, it's it's relatively simple. Um, and of course, the biochar we store it in the soils uh, and uh, and store it there durably and safely. Um, over time, the biochar will move towards um, nature's own uh, organic uh, carbon um, carbon uh, carbon storages uh, in the soil. You know, we have old kind of biochar from the Terra Preta and the Amazonian rainforest from 2,500 years ago that we can still you know find traces. Um, What's been really exciting for us is that now, like in the past, there was more of a focus on studying the inert or studying the label fraction of the biochar. And now we've seen the focus shift more to the inert fraction. So looking at um, the reflectance rate uh, that's been used for decades to look at uh, inorganic coal and fossil coal, which of course has been, you know, generated in, in millions of years uh, in the Earth's crust. And there, you know, we've gotten tremendous results of, you know, 500,000 years of, uh, of, of durability. Um, and so, so that's been really exciting. And of course, you know, um, working, working with that, testing our biochar, really future-proofing our, um, our, not only our process, but of course our product, you know, the biochar and the carbon removal credit. Great. I appreciate you walking through that. And I think excellent to hear how you're each thinking about MRV personally and as, as your companies, um, both where there's points of commonality on this commitment to MRV and, and really having that, that firm uh, working through it, and, and then also where they're, how, it, how it will just start to vary by different pathway as, as you're starting to measure up, monitor, um, and, and all the rest. Uh, 
in, in all the different ground we've been covering, be it talking about protocols or policy or individually how you're approaching MRV as a, as a company, curious to have you expand, uh, each of you, on bottlenecks or challenges of, of MRV and whether you want to answer that point to policy, point to the marketplace. There, there's obviously different directions of where you can take it, but I think it's in some ways the inverse of all the grounds we've been covering so far. Anything in particular that you want to call out as an acute or a long-term challenge to, to really um, having uh, as carbon removal scales how, how MRV is scaling along with it. So, Brad, let's start with you on this one, and, and we'll, go, we'll go down to then hear from Mike and Hannah. Yeah, it's a good question. There's a lot of directions you could take this one. I will start with uh, when you were trying to do these projects for the first time, which is even with biochar, right, which is a very well understood process. There's now dozens of different approaches to how you can create that. You are creating and testing your approach for the first time yourself and typically without a whole lot of help or guidance uh, on, on how and where you should do these things. So that means developing those models yourselves. So that means and very often we develop our sensor systems ourselves, right? Uh, figuring out the laboratory testing components. So even if you can write out, here is your end-to-end -end methodology of all the different components that need to be measured at what point, there tends to be gaps in the publicly available resources or partners that you can use to do that, right? So all of a sudden you're a company who, you know, wants to do alkalinity enhancement or wants to do uh, a, a nature-based project and you're developing carbon sensors, uh, right? And that is such a different business than the mass moving components. It's such a different business than the biomass sourcing. So you essentially have all these small carbon removal companies that are 20 or 30 or 40 people having to vertically integrate themselves and do massive R&D investments on something that, you know, an individual company would spend billions of dollars on if it was, you know, if it was large scale, right? So thinking about how we can connect the different components of the ecosystem to sort of de-risk it for individual carbon removal companies so that they have other folks who can come in and help them with their process and help them specialize in what they do best I think that's a way to really start to speed up the development. A uh, great example of that is, is ocean sensors, right? Uh, there are a number of companies who do these very high quality specified ocean sensors that help you understand carbonate chemistry better. But the markets for those are so niche right now that they're incredibly expensive. Very often they're only selling to governments. So the price point, as you would imagine, it's, it's, become, a, um, it's become a government, government procurement uh, focused process or the market is so niche that they're actually thinking about shut, shutting down some of these product lines that are going to be massively valuable for companies like ourselves going forward, right? So the faster we can connect, and there are funding ways to do that, there are just ecosystem development ways to do that, so that we don't have to create all of the different components of this ourselves, I think it's really gonna help a lot more companies get off the ground into their first or second or third project faster. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Like, it's it really is, um, you know, it's, it's a maturity of the market um, status that we're in right now where the leaders are having to do everything. Like, like defining an MRV for any of us is a necessity. It's not a competitive advantage because MRV by definition is a transparent, you know, sort of process that you have to release to the world and have people, you know, adopt and trust systems, like take it forward. If you want to understand what a trust system is, check out the Reykjavik protocol, the bottom layer. But that, you know, sort of protocol development, that MRV development piece is an investment that the leaders in the space are making by necessity and not by choice. And as things evolve, it's going to be uh, exactly what Brad said. You know, we, we, we're going to see, I think, uh, a um, specialization in the space where people can find niches where they can make money uh, or where uh, institutions can step in to provide trust to you know to support these kinds of developments and and that'll help out a lot. I think for us in terms of of MRV development, um, I I always say you know people ask us all this all but what do you need? What do you need in order to progress? What do you need to, in order to do what you do? And what I keep saying is actually what we need is attention. Like it's a weird thing to say, but attention it really in a large part is the currency of the day. And um, you know when we get attention, when somebody's willing to sit down. And not just say, oh, we'd like to see this progress or whatever, but to say, I'm going to validate your MRV. I'm going to review it. I'm going to give it a check mark, or I'm going to provide you comment or feedback or, you know, anything like that. Like, that kind of attention in the MRV space is what's going to create the trust for us to really scale these things out. Um, we talked about Puro as a great sort of uh, emerging registry, or not emerging, sorry, a registry that is working with emerging technologies. That's what I mean to say. Um, that is uh, taking a leadership position on 
you know, validating these MRVs and looking at these solutions and rapidly bringing a layer of trust on top of these MRV uh, protocols. Isometric is another one, so we're working with Isometric right now to get a protocol out the door, fingers crossed, by sort of the beginning of Q2 of 24, that will have a, have a, a real full-fledged registry, pro registry protocol for ocean alkalinity enhancement that we can make use of, that is trusted, that has been developed by scientists and everything like that. And we just need more of that. We need more and more sort of organizations coming out and saying, I'm going to spend the time to truly review this, truly get engaged with it, and provide my feedback, provide you know my concerns or whatever it is, but to improve it collectively. At, because MRV being the foundation of all of this stuff is entirely based on trust. And that, that's what it is. We trust that this has in fact happened. With more eyes means more trust, and I think that's a really key thing. Great, appreciate your perspectives on that, and just linking back to the trust building, which which is obviously so important in it. Hannah, how how about from you? Your thoughts on the challenges? Yeah, so of course, us, you know, developing our own proprietary technology. Uh, we are registered by Puro. They have one biochar methodology. Um, so sometimes, you know, we find the challenge of okay, well, um, you know. You guys are developing this great thing. You have such high permanence. You have such an efficient process. You have such high net carbon removal. Um, but you know, uh, can you not, you know, put your price point down to, you know, to this, you know, person doing biochar, you know, in their backyard in a in a farm somewhere? And so, so I think that's the challenge sometimes when you're when you're pushing the science as well. Is that okay? How do you then, when you do need to differentiate from the market, how do you do it? And we haven't seen that that so much. We do see the market moving into that direction because, I mean, even with the CRCF, you have biochar in three categories. You have it in carbon farming, you have it in carbon stored in products, and then you have it in the permanent storage category. But there hasn't really been any, um, any kind of guidance on how do these different categories play with each other. Like, for instance, us, you know, we're definitely in the permanent storage category. We have a solid biochar carbon removal durable process, um, but then for instance, when we sell the biochar to you know, a sustainable substrate company, it goes into the soils on a farm, it also does emissions reduction, it also has all these great co-benefits for the soil, reducing N2O emissions from fertilizers, reducing the carbon emissions from fertilizers. So is there actually a thing where you, know, you have biochar in the, carbon, uh, in the permanent storage category where you have the carbon removal unit or carbon removal credit and then you know, once the biochar is actually applied to the soils, there could be a co-benefit to the farmer in the, in the form of a subsidy or in the form of an emissions reduction credit from the actual emissions reduction potential. Um, we also see that, you know, of course, you know, for good reason, it is a high regulator and it's a high, um, high, um, you know, high burden to, of proof to, to really prove this, you know, very uh, high MRV for, for biochar. But, you know, how are these, these three going to play, play together? Of course, biochar can also be used in, in construction applications. Pura also says that this is durable carbon removal. In the commission, we're now discussing, okay, what's going to be the MRV for this? Is the, is the credit going to be only for the lifetime of the building? Or can we actually have contract, contractual obligations for, for the biochar, or any kind of, you know, carbonated, you know, material? in cement or construction applications that they're not going to go through a thermochemical process that would have a risk of reversal. I mean, today, you know, we're not even seeing so much, you know, cement or concrete being recycled. So there could be a pretty easy way to just, you know, do a contractual obligation. Um, um, so, so just how do these three play in together? Because, you know, there are, there is a multitude of, of, of biochars even, you know, we, we went from, you know, very high level of, okay, CDR, MRV, then we said terrestrial CDR, or ocean CDR, then we discussed different ocean-based approaches, different, you know, terrestrial-based approaches, and then even with biochar, there are so many different ways of doing it, so how do we, and we need to do them all, so how do we, how do we ensure that we incentivize the industrial scale, you know, high-tech, high-quality, persistent biochar, and that we also ensure that we encourage the kind of, you know, the biochar that's, you know, maybe someone would otherwise burn their biomass on their farm and they think, okay, well, it makes much, much more sense for me to do this biochar, but oh well, you know, sending, paying thousands and thousands for an LCA and for, for registries and for credits just isn't, you know, going to cut it. So how are we going to enable that as well? Great. Yeah, thank you for sharing those insights. I, I think it's, 
good for us to hear about what some of the challenges are that, that you've each highlighted in terms of where we are and where we need to scale to as we're working towards gigaton scale removal and, and touching on how we build the, the trust in, in the market and ensure that we've got MRV around it. Building on that, because we've talked about the challenges, I, I think that inverse side of the opportunities and also just starting to chart out what's ahead. Uh, we're in the final stretch of this of this year and just as we're going into 2024 and we're looking at this accelerated timeline of where the IPCC is telling us the carbon removal need that, that it needs to scale to in a fairly short amount of time. Um, you've all talked about how integrally linked MRV is to that growth of carbon removal. So just hearing what you think the big trends are in MRV of what's ahead, what you want to put on folks' radars of, of where you think this is going. Um, and I recognize it might be some of what you've already touched on. You know, are we going to see more policies on MRV? Are we going to see more signatories in the Reykjavik protocol? But but I think just things that you want to call folks' attention to is, is what you see as the big trends ahead would, would be great uh, for, for us to touch on. Hannah, why don't we start with you on that, and then we'll, we'll work our way back down. Yeah, thanks. So I think, you know, what actually Brad and I spoke about before and that we've spoken with other, you know, CDR actors is that today it's just so important that we do keep these regulatory frameworks open for innovation that, you know, startups and companies developing something that perhaps we haven't even heard of know that the door isn't shut on them. And I think that's been fantastic to hear that, you know, the, the, the supervisory body of 6.4 has actually managed to to really you know, make that a reality. I mean, let's see, you know, as the negotiations progress, there's nothing that's signed yet, but at least that they have the willingness to to leave this door open for upcoming methodological development. I mean, this is something that we haven't seen, even in the European Union. So, so that's definitely... Um, exciting thing. I think, you know, as the trilogues with CRCF move forward, you know, at the moment, um, you know, they would leave out so many technologies that we really hope that this is this is going to be ironed out. And I, I hear that there's going to be a big push from several signatories. I hear there's like maybe 60 signatories for a certain type, certain letter calling for technology neutrality. So keep your eyes open on Monday for, for this letter that's coming out. Yeah, I, I think, Henry, you're absolutely right. I think that the, the big deal here from the policy perspective is that tech neutrality, right? So driving towards tech neutrality, making sure that these systems are looking for outcomes and they're not looking for, you know, methodologies or, or exactly how those outcomes are going to be achieved. Those outcomes have to be achieved in a way that is high trust, that is high verifi verifiability, that is low uncertainty. And those are the kind of metrics we need to look at. It's not, we can't be solving for how do we incentivize a particular technology, we have to be solving for how are we going to achieve the goals within the IPCC report. And, and there's so much evolution within this space and it has to happen so quickly. We have such a short period of time to get to that kind of scale that we need to hit our targets that locking out solutions at this point in time, even if it's you know to a point where it's like, oh, we could open it up again later, we know that the speed of the regulatory system is, is slow. And so making sure that we're outcome focused, that we are pushing towards the outcomes we want rather than the methods we want within these systems is, is incredibly important. And that's true, uh, as you said, this letter that's coming out, but also and in, in, in the EU, but it's across every different regulatory framework um, in North America and, and everywhere else as well. I think in terms of MRV, uh, we're gonna see a lot of innovation over the next year in terms of new pathways coming onto registries. Um, and especially registries like Puro and like Isometric that are leading on, you know, being able to be agile enough to pick up what's happening in the field and the, and the most emerging science around how we build trust uh, in these types of systems. So keep an eye out for a very rapidly shifting world in terms of the protocols that we can actually use for registry-based uh, carbon removals and carbon crediting. And I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, thing to watch as well. Um, I think that's it for me. But. Well, yeah, totally agree with all that. And I think with that, you know, registry and the pace of the innovation, I think I'd, I've been plugging the XPRIZE report that they put out a couple months ago, which is the 300 plus companies who have applied to the next round. Over half of them said they didn't even have a standard or a methodology, right? They just wanted to innovate, they wanted to grow, they wanted to build. So there has been this fragmentation of go-to-market opportunity for companies who just want to figure out what works and what is effective in carbon removal. That is great in a lot of ways in that there is that freedom and flexibility that maybe didn't exist a couple years ago. But what it also does is it gives us a ticking clock to figure out how wide can that space get before we set the bounds and we, we coalesce and we bring standardization back into it. That could be one year, it could be three. There's policy is going to play a huge, a huge angle there. But what I'm hopeful for alongside that is 
to see a disaggregation of some of the responsibilities that have historically fallen on these registries so that experts can come in at each step of the process to provide risk mitigation and trust, right? So I mentioned the auditors. I think insurers have another great place to play there. They're doing a lot of great work to think about how you can shift off of the traditional buffer pool model and into more trust-based insurance products for especially these new product types. Uh, the role that independent scientific advisory boards can play in coming in and providing confidence to a specific pathway. Cascade Climate, as an example, in the enhanced weathering space has been able to be a philanthropic backed nonprofit who says, we know there's issues with, with uh, perceived issues with enhanced rock weathering. Can we come in as a non-conflicted actor and help to just build a methodology that works, right? So rather than sort of passing all our problems to these folks, whether if it's, if it's even the buyers, right? In many ways, Microsoft is, is the best diligence and trust building partner we have because they've built out the capacity to test these systems. Taking some of the pressure off those folks who are doing specific things so that you can you know, have the auditors play their role, have the insurers play their role, it's also what I think a lot of the investors and financiers we're speaking to are interested in, right? Because they want to see that this market is maturing into something that is investable long term, and they are starting to get much more serious in those conversations. So I am super encouraged by those moves. I think that's going to be a lot of pilots and a lot of innovation in this space. I'm sure some missteps as well. Uh, but the more flexibility we can give companies who are trying to innovate to do this from a policy perspective and from a go-to-market perspective, uh, the better. Excellent. Appreciate you sharing some of the what's ahead. It definitely leaves me feeling energized about all the opportunities that we have going into the new year. I think just this this alignment that the that that you're articulating, the alignment around the importance of MRV, the benefits of tech neutrality that you're touching on, and then what the particular opportunities are to ensure that we're continuing to build trust in the market, um, really ironing out the details on MRV, be it in, in policy or the technicalities of the particular project levels that you've been talking about. So just want to thank you all for sharing your insights. And I think for folks that have been tuning in, would, would call out to just picking up on the comment Mike made about the benefit of how MRV benefits from engagement, how folks tapping into this and following along the conversation, reviewing particular things, following up on the policies that Hannah was talking about or digging into the Reykjavik protocol that Brad and Mike were touching on. The Carbon Business Council put out uh, a policy brief on MRV that is an explainer on this and talks about some of the opportunities and challenges ahead. So there's no shortage of great materials out there. And I think just starting to take a deeper dive into this to understand this intersection of MRV and CDR and uh, it's, it's great. So thank you all again. Appreciate you sharing everything that you did and yeah. Take care all. Thanks, Ben. Okay.